Hey guys, and uh, welcome back to the channel. So in this video, I'm going to continue with the installation uh, of my DIY heated driveway project here. So if you've been following along uh, down the playlist on the channel, if you've been a subscriber and uh, you're kind of coming along with me as I as I redocument all of this. Um, so far, you know, video one, we, we laid out the pecs and the snowmelt loops. Uh, then we went ahead and installed it, ripped up the old driveway, installed the new. There's, there's videos on all of that in the playlist. Then I uh, basically did a bunch of math using uh, the Upener snowmelt guide to size my heaters, determine how many BTUs I'm going to need to accomplish what I want to do, and determine system temperatures and all of that stuff. And then uh, the last video I uploaded was basically uh, a piping layout that I had come up with using diagrams from Takagi, research online, and just basically coming up with a system that works exactly how I want it to work. And so far, I mean, all of this is installed. If, if, you're, if you're new to my channel, um, I started uploading videos back in February of 21 of the driveway melting and working, and then now I'm just kind of going back and uploading all the videos of the installation. So a couple of these have been voiceovers. Uh, this one was supposed to be a video because I did record a lot of video of this, and unfortunately, I lost some of the early video in this project, which was this video. It was me installing the heaters originally and all of that. Um, I was not downloading the video off the GoPro as often as I probably should have been because I have a big SD card in there and something happened with it. And unfortunately, I lost uh, a few weeks of video there. So fortunately, I have pictures and I can just walk you guys through a little bit of pictures here of what I did. And then at the end, uh, I do have a video that'll, that'll catch us up. And from here forward, it's probably mostly going to be videos of me talking about what I'm actually doing and showing you guys. So anyway, um, yeah, what you're looking at here is first things first, you know, this utility room in my basement um, was, it was not fully finished. Uh, I had studded the walls when we built the addition and then had it all spray foamed and everything, but I really didn't have anything on the walls. Um, <clears throat> you know, I thought about drywall and other ideas as far as what I wanted to do. But at the time, this was pre-COVID, uh, you know, these sheets of basically three-quarter inch cabinet grade plywood were like 39 bucks at Home Depot. Um, I mean, more more recently, I saw them up to like 65. So, you know, if, if that was today, I don't know that I would have chose this. But at the time, it was relatively inexpensive. And I thought that would be a great material to use because then I could screw into it pretty much anywhere and have a really solid mounting surface. So this is the back wall of my house. Here you can see the existing Bosch tankless water heater. And I talked about this in the last video where I went over um, the piping layout and some of the drawbacks to this. We've had this unit basically installed for 15 years. It's moved around to a couple different locations in the basement, but you know, I think we purchased the unit in 2007 and it did work well. It just had some drawbacks. Uh, I'll put a link to that video above if you gonna if you guys want to reference it. So I just started going around the utility room and installing this plywood. I scribed around certain things and you know cut out for the, the sub panel box and routed the edge and you know tried to make it look uh, as nice as I could. So two videos ago, um, number nine, the the sizing the heaters and determining the system temperatures, you know, I, I was on the fence as far as whether I needed one or two tankless units and ultimately I decided to go with two so what I did before I bought the units um, this was still like November of 2019 I, I made templates out of cardboard and started to kind of place them where I thought I would want the units now if you look up here on the top this is an inch and a quarter gas line that goes all the way to the front of my house inch and a quarter it might even be inch and a half um, but I had put a T in here at one point. I I think, you know, in the back of my head, I kind of always knew that I would have something here on this wall, whether it would be, you know, a, a wall hung boiler, tankless hot water heater, whatever. So I kind of already had provisioned for that. So um, I, I made these cardboard templates and started to kind of set them up on the wall to uh, to figure out what I wanted to do. 
Um, ultimately, I went with two. And I set these up. Now, the spacing for this, I actually got Takagi sells a pre built, like, manifold or uh, multi unit. I forget what they call it. It's like a system you can buy on a rack that comes pre-assembled with the gas line, the hot, the cold, uh, the condensate, all that. And it's on like a big rack and it'll hold up to four units. I think they're, they're back to back, two, two on each side. And anyway, I pulled the dimensions off of that drawing from their website. And that's where I got this center to center distance is it's exactly how Takagi mounts them on their pre-built manifold that you can buy. Um, so I kept them the distance apart that they recommended. That has all your minimum clearances. And as you can see here, I shut the gas off to the house. I had a couple of uh, nipples made, um, you know, just went to Home Depot. I either had the pipe already or I bought a piece of pipe and just had them cut it and thread it for me to what I wanted. Here I put a half inch line or three quarter, it might be, that runs out the back of the house. And that's for a future uh, natural gas grill. If I want to put a natural gas grill on my deck and, and uh, get rid of the propane one. So anyway, um, I tacked up these cardboard templates just to see how I'd be looking for venting and where my water lines would line up and everything. And then I went ahead and installed the, uh, the black iron pipe and got everything buttoned up. And I, I think I even, I don't, think I had done it here yet but then I went over and just kind of painted everything in like a flat black paint you can kind of see that here so this was now December 14th of 2019 and I had purchased the units uh, bought them online and got them all mounted exactly where I wanted them and you know made sure that everything lined up with the gas lines and everything which it did it all it all ended up uh, mounting perfectly exactly where I wanted it if you guys are doing this new one one thing i probably should have done that i didn't know is i might have put like some sort of foam or rubber isolation pad behind these units uh the fans in these things as as the fan speed changes when it goes through its different stages of modulation it the fans are kind of loud and i think i'm not it's not helping in my case that i have it mounted to a wood wall you know, all wood wall that's on wood studs that that's tied right into the floor above. So you will occasionally hear this low vibration when they're on. You know, it almost sounds like somebody's in your driveway with with a truck with the engine running sort of thing. I mean, it's not loud. It doesn't wake us up at night or anything like that, but you can hear it. And unfortunately now, you know, I had already sized these turnips here for the gas a certain distance off the wall per the specs and i really can't go and bump you know take these down and, and push them out because it's going to change all that i'd have to get longer nipples and now that the plumbing's all done and everything it it would be way more work than than what it's worth we can live with a little bit of noise so um yeah i mounted both heaters on the wall got them plumbed in gas wise tested everything for leaks soapy water everything was good um, no issues. Here's a look at the inside of these of these bad boys. Um, and as you can see here, this this gray cable below. So that's the Easy Link cable. And what that does is it lets the two units talk to each other. And in my case, I'm I'm not really using it, so to speak, like the Easy Link. I think in the way that it was designed. I mean, this was designed so that if you had a variable flow like say you only have one faucet on and you're only using like one gallon a minute well one one heater one tankless unit can handle that so they take turns as far as which one is priority and you know after so many cycles or so many hours this one will then handle it and then it'll rotate back to this one and they just keep going back and forth every so often or every however many cycles and you know, as the flow increases, if then somebody turns on uh, a shower, two showers, the dishwasher, and now number one needs help, it'll call for number two to turn on. And, you know, basically they both stay exercised because they take turns being the priority heater. Now, in my case, I'm using a pump to circulate a tank, like I explained in the last video. So I'm giving these things a very exact specific flow every single time that pump turns on. Okay, they're, they're getting, you know, almost eight gallons a minute. So really, whether they're easy linked or not, I really don't think would make a huge 
difference because they're both seeing the same exact flow no matter what. Um, and, and they really don't shut off ever. Like one won't shut off because the gallons per minute that that pump is producing is constant. It's the same. It's not variable. So anyway, I still have them easy linked and, you know, so far I've, I've left it like that. I might do some playing around in the future and unlink them. And, and then I could actually set separate temperatures on them if I wanted to try doing that. Um, but yeah, so here's another shot of below. You can see I, I tidied up the power wires and the, uh, the easy link cable there that runs to the other unit. I've explained in my other videos, my electrical system overview, the top outlet is hot all the time. The bottom is, is on this smart switch right here. And the bottom, one of these is snow melt, one of them is radiant. And that's what activates my pumps on the secondary side. So here's a, a parts haul, um, you know, just a picture of, of what I had ordered to kind of start to build this. And yes, you know, you're looking at, geez, I want to say two, three grand worth of parts here. Um, you know, some of these orders were not cheap, but still I had quotes of 40 or $50,000 to, to do this. So, I mean, I'm still way in the, in the green as far as uh, DIYing it and saving money. Um, and all of this isn't necessarily for just the the snowmelt install either. I replumbed the whole water line in my utility room. I did a pressure balance loop that runs around the entire room. I replumbed my hose bibs where there's one that goes up to the, the balcony, one that goes to the driveway, my irrigation system. The, a lot of these valves are for that, and, and you'll start to see that. So this isn't all specifically strictly for the snowmelt, but a lot of it is a part of this this project. So then I just got to work soldering. Um, I did a lot of this on the bench out in the garage. Um, coming out of these heaters, this is three quarter inch male. So I just went into three quarter inch female to one inch copper. And I wanted everything one inch. I know you can buy pre-made isolation valves. Uh, a lot of them are three quarter. And then the, the actual valve, if you look inside, I mean, the, the openings like three eighths of an inch i mean that the water can get through so i wanted to make sure i was getting the fullest flow through these units that i possibly could so i wanted to come right off the units and go right into one inch and then i basically built my own uh, isolation valves and that's what these are you shut these ball valves off and then i can open up these hose bib fittings and i can flush the tank with units and it's basically a, a pre-made isolation valve that you can buy uh, same thing just this is all full port one inch full port ball valves everything is is wide open for flow i didn't want any restrictions in flow so i started to build now you'll notice here i talk about this in in the previous videos too this is reverse return so my return is going to come up here on the left and come into the units and then my supply is going to come out on out of the left side of the heater and go to the right over here so no matter which direction the water you know, the, the flow is equal through the units. And here's another shot of that. I've started to go to my inch and a half. My primary loop is inch and a half. And then at these one by one by inch and a half T's, it steps down to each heater. And same thing as it goes the other way, it steps up from each heater from one inch to inch and a half as it goes down the wall. Uh, also here, you can see my pressure relief valves on the hot side. Uh, this is the flat plate heat exchanger. So I went with the biggest one that I could find, and that was a hundred plate. You know, there is calculators out there online. This gets really technical. Um, Kalefi has a, a whole section in some of their training on how to size these and how to figure out if you have, you know, a certain temperature coming in on the, the primary side, what, what temperature will you have coming out with certain flow rates and certain you know, temperature losses and all that. I figured for my purpose, especially with the snow melt running, I wanted to get as much heat as I possibly could out of that primary loop and into the secondary loop. So I purchased this big hundred plate heat exchanger. Um, here I'm just mocking up, you know, again, I had already done the system layout, but you know, I would kind of mock stuff up on the bench and just figure out, okay. And even some of this changed, this this is pretty much how I soldered this up. Um, 
yeah, this isn't here. There's a check valve here. But anyway, this is not. You come down, I think it does a 90 and another 90 just to get stuff to line up and stuff to fit on the wall. Uh, this was early January that I was that I was doing this. So then I had, uh, I had to figure out how I was going to mount this flat plate heat exchanger on the wall. And this thing was heavy. Um, I didn't actually weigh it, but I mean, it, it, it was a solid piece of copper and stainless steel. Um, so it did come with these metal brackets that I think you would have, would have had to mount it facing out from the wall. So these ports would have to be looking you know, right at us, one, two, three, four. And I, I didn't want it in that configuration because it was going to stick out from the wall way too much with these and then your 90s and everything. So I wanted it to lay flat on the wall. So what I did was I came up with the idea of using pocket screws. And I, I just ripped down some extra cutoffs of the three quarter inch cabinet grade plywood. And I pocket screwed them together with, I also, you know, glued them with wood glue as well. And then I came down lined it up on the wall and I, I pocket screwed the, the, you know what out of it to the wall. Um, I wanted this thing to be really sturdy and this was so strong. I also wood glued it to the wall and I could honestly put my foot in here and stand on this thing and it wouldn't go anywhere. I mean, it's solid. So then I figured, you know, that's a big piece of copper and stainless. That's going to give off a lot of heat. So, when I had designed this and measured out, I added an extra inch to all the dimensions. So I added an inch to the front and the back. I added an inch to the height and I added an inch to the, to the width. And what that did was it lets me add half inch, uh, insulation, just pink, you know, foam board insulation. So I cut a piece for the back top sides and basically slid that heat exchanger right in there and it fit perfect. I mean, it wasn't super tight. I didn't have to bang it in. It wasn't loose either. You could not move this up or down at all. So it, it was nice and snug. It slid right in there. Uh, here you can see the side shot, the insulation ends right, right at the edge of the, uh, of the heat exchanger there. And then I had marked my, my direction of flow that I was going to have things, uh, flowing through it. And you do usually want to go with an opposite direction you don't want your direction going the same way you'll get more heat transfer doing this and uh, inside that heat exchanger there's little v grooves that the water gets real turbulent as it goes over them and that helps it pick up heat so you want the you want the uh, the heat going in opposite directions so anyway then I cut uh, another little piece over here on the right pocket screwed it to the wall cut a piece of insulation slid the whole thing in there cut a piece to go over it and then cut the lid out and very carefully pre-drilled into the plywood and screwed that lid on. And that lid hasn't come off since I did this. This was January 5th, 2020, according to the timestamp on the picture. And I haven't uh, taken this off since. So it's, I mean, I really haven't had a, a need to. Everything was tight here. It was not leaking or anything. So, um, I was good. I made some labels just to kind of keep my own mental sanity as I was building this. Uh, so my, this is where my, this is my primary loop. My domestic water comes in here and goes out here. Okay. So the, so it's going hot to cold down and over here, it's going the opposite way. The cooler radiant comes in and picks up heat and goes out hot. So they're, it's opposite directions. Uh, so then continuing on, now that I had that mounted where I wanted it, I was able to, to start building my more of my primary loop. Um, this isn't tight. That's why that looks a little uh, like it's lean in there. It probably was. But I tried to do a, as much of this soldering on the bench in the garage as I could. Uh, it made it easier. You know, I could put, put things in the vise and heat it up, not worry about burning the wall. Um, there were some joints that I had to do down here on the wall. And... That's okay. You know, I was careful. I used an asbestos cloth and a piece of metal and, and didn't, didn't burn anything, but I tried to keep everything on the bench nice and straight and flat and do as much of it out there as, as I could. So January 14th, um, here's where I was at. It's about what, 10 days, uh, nine days later, I would come down and work on this when I could. Um, you know, again, I'm not in the business, so this is, 
not my full-time job. I'm just kind of DIYing it as I go. So I would come down and, and kind of build it and think about things and then, you know, change things and just kind of went along as I, as I went. So as you can see here, as I've mentioned in other videos, uh, this is the tap off the primary loop for the, the tank. And this is my hot water, basically buffer tank. It's just a 20 gallon tank. So next I, I continued working on the primary loop, got this down. Now, one of my original concerns was tankless hot water heaters have a very high head loss as water flows through them. So in other words, you know, they're not as, as free flowing as a boiler, uh, even a wall hung condensing boiler. These things, the, the way they heat the water is if the water is moving too fast through them, they have valves that will then start to choke down the flow so that it can properly heat the water. And if you look in the manual, you know, yes, Takagi will tell you they this thing can flow 10 gallons a minute for each unit and everything, but that's at a certain temperature rise. If you start to get up where you have 60 degree incoming water from the street, you know, and you're trying to raise it 80 degrees to 140, it, you're not going to get 10 gallons a minute flowing through these units. Uh, it's going to, the units are going to slow down, that valve's going to close and because it needs more time basically to heat the water. It can't do it that quickly as it goes through. So because they have a high head loss, one of the things I was concerned was with that, was that I might need two pumps in series, which I have a, a good friend of mine who is running um, one of these Takagi's for his heated floors in his car wash. And now he's running glycol right through the the unit itself, but he ended up needing two 0013s in series in order to get enough pressure, in order to get like street pressure, 55 pounds, to push the glycol through the units uh, properly. Now, I started with one, but when I build this, I left this so that if I needed to, I could install another one right below it. My plan was I would cut this copper off here, I would get another or reuse this fitting and put the mail on there. I would make a quarter inch stainless steel plate and just bolt the two flanges together, one to the next. And then I would have two 13s in series. It would, it would double the, uh, it would basically double the pressure, double the, the head that, that these things can put out. And then uh, I would be fine. In the end, I didn't end up needing it because I'm using two units it's splitting that flow between them. So I'm not trying to push eight gallons a minute through one. I'm only pushing four gallons a minute through each one. And I think that really helps because the valves pretty much stay wide open all the time because uh, they can handle that degree rise at four gallons a minute. It's not that big of a push for the tankless units. So anyway, uh, yeah, you can see here, I started to mock up um, where I wanted things. I, I didn't end up using this tank. Um, I ended up selling it and purchasing a red uh, Extrol Radiant tank, an RX series instead of an EX. And I, I got a bigger one. This is a uh, five gallon, I wanna say. I ended up with a 10. Um, so yeah. And here's some more pictures. Here's a picture with the, the primary loop, almost done. Uh, I don't believe these were these joints here were soldered yet, but you know, as you can see, it's starting to come together. Spiro vent for the Portable expansion tank on the primary side, temperature and pressure gauge, and uh, again, hose bibs for flushing. I can shut this valve off. I can shut this valve off. I can hook a, a pump and a hose up here and flush that heat exchanger, the domestic side anyway, that might have minerals or whatever in it, clean that out. Over here, you can see I'm starting to plumb in the secondary loop. I, was gonna, I put a T in back there with my pressure relief valve for the secondary loop, which is only like a 30 pound, and just started figuring out how I'm going to come into the tank, where I'm going to come out of the tank. And, you know, you can draw this all out on paper, but really you can only do <laughs> so much. You really just need to kind of build it as you go and, um, you know, fit, fit things together. And, and plans change. You know, I had originally planned to put this circulation pump over closer to like underneath the units and it ended up going over on the wall to the left behind the sump pump because that's the best place it fit there was an outlet right there it's just you know and that's okay as long as it's it's in where it needs to be on the drawing somewhere then 
you know, build it as you go and, and make it work. Um, this was an early diagram that I was using, a layout I had drawn. Uh, again, the previous video, number 10 there, shows the the final one I made where I had two units, but, you know, just, I would always have a diagram down so I could kind of follow along. I didn't lose track of, of what was going on and uh, proved to be very helpful. And then I just started building things on the bench. Okay, I'm going to come out here. I'm going to go into here with this and, you know, it helps. So um, these unions, these are inch and a half unions that come off this flat plate. And I, I used unions in the in the event, I guess, that I ever did have to replace the flat plate heat exchanger. I mean, I hope I never do, but um, at least this way, I wouldn't have to totally disassemble the entire, you know, the entire system. But I started to get worried um, reading horror stories about getting these unions to seal properly, especially these ones in the back, because I really couldn't get the proper wrenches on them. Um, there wasn't enough room between the wall. I should have I should have built this a little bit deeper, maybe had one inch of insulation behind it instead of a half so I could get a proper wrench around these back fittings. Um, so I was really worried these were going to leak. Uh, you go to the forums, I had read horror stories about that. But in the end, um, I, I did wrap them with Teflon tape, which I know unions, you know, you're really not supposed to do that. You don't need to because it's not that threaded connection that's preventing it from leaking. It's actually the mating between the two surfaces, the copper uh, on this piece and the copper on this piece where they come together. So, but if anything, the Teflon tape makes these nuts slide better. So you can actually get another quarter or half turn out of them and really tighten them down because that Teflon tape helps lubricate the threads as you're tightening this. So yeah, um, started to kind of just, just build things here. And again, another shot of the primary loop from underneath. And here is the one of the final shots here, uh, pictures, before we get into the video. And as you can see, it's starting to come together. Um, second, pressure relief valve on the secondary side is in. And then starting to figure out you know, where I'm going to come up the wall and go over to the, uh, to the pumps. So again, just another, uh, another shot. This was January 26th at this point. And just another shot of uh, the bottom. So here's kind of a walkthrough um, that I did. And this video was, I believe, on my iPhone. So I did not lose this one on the GoPro. And you can just, you know, it just kind of walks through all my all my joints and how, every, how I was kind of laying everything out. And here you can see that primary loop. Here's the tap for the water heater and yeah it's cycling but yeah so that's pretty much uh this video so the next videos are going to be um basically me um they're going to be me talking uh most i do have all the footage from here forward i started doing more consistent backups i started emptying the gopro a lot more often so that in the event the sd card does go bad or error out or whatever like it did i don't i only lose maybe one or two days worth of recording and not you know three weeks or a month like i did here but anyway um yeah so if you're interested uh keep watching the next one is going to be a walkthrough and then i'm going to start to get into all of it uh i'll show you some of the soldering i did i'll i'll walk you through you know, where I run the pipes and why, um, the venting, the filling, all of that stuff is, is coming over the next few weeks in these videos. So if you like this stuff, uh, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell to be notified. And also, since it is technically December now of 2021, I've already started to record some snowmelt videos. I've turned the, the system on twice already this winter and I did do time lapse and clock the meter and everything like I did last year. So I'm going to start uploading more snowmelt videos too. So anyway, uh, thanks for watching guys and we'll catch you on the next one.